key to Jimmy? Well, off and on, uh, for the whole time I was at Darrow, I That, that's way back in the, I guess in the 60s. Uh. But I know this mic skiing, worked with it last so. week. This is a remote mic. Oh, okay. I mean, how yeah. this mic would be the, yeah, I knew the fellow should be the one. Go that way. And, uh, we'll put, figure it out. One of the original. But well, you're not getting. Uh, King Terrible. Uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, um, again, I forgot his name. You're positive your mic is on. It worked last week, and it's. I mean, you're positive it's, it's physically on. Well, let me turn it off. Does it have a battery? Yeah, could I, was be just gonna, off? I was just gonna ask. Them. Could be. Is there a condenser in there? With a little. There is a little open switch here. Uh -huh. Let's see what's in there. <laughs> you might have a battery that's non-functioning. Yeah, it is one of those little round batteries. Oh, you probably have a dead battery. Let's look at it. That could have been if they if it got left on last week yeah. when they if did you the recording. Leave it, if you leave it in there, yeah, you have to take it out us. every time. Um, um, do you have a customer to pay? Where, where's the home? Um, there's a little, uh, little fuzzy thing. That's We're taping right. one upstairs that we shouldn't be. This is one because he wasn't scheduled. Um, and that little scheduled scheduled is sitting outside the hall. Yeah. Let's we'll see. Um, let's just see if they happen to have. And I don't think I heard. Uh, we'd be very lucky if there was a speaker. Up, they got audio. We have audio problems. What's up? The gentleman that you guys started taping up there. Yeah. Wasn't on the schedule. You're kidding. Well, besides that, he, she forgot to put the mic on him. <laughs> That's a problem. Oh my God. The camera operator's going, I have no audio, I have no audio. I look over, he's no freaking mic on. <laughs> so our whole Everything. schedule is going to move to the right 45 minutes. Mm. Unless we. Should you break him? Pardon I think, me? I think we should break him. Well, they've been going now for 20 minutes at least. Yeah, I, I think is the guy who's supposed to be on the schedule there. Yeah, it, you I know who it is. It's our it's our uh, tenth mountain light guy from right. our seven thirty a.m. Let's go in. I will tell you what. Let's go go up there and just say, look, uh, I think there's been a misunderstanding. Put him on the schedule for this unit C here. You know. Otherwise, it's going to screw up our whole day. I'll, uh, what you could do is ask the tenth mountain guy if he wants to sign up for one of the unit three things. You want to do that? Down here. Yeah. Okay. Because there's lots of slots there. Yeah, we didn't look out on the battery there. I'm going to check in, key, in the bag in case our camera guy happened to have a separate bag of battery in his camera. So you're going to probably not going to be that lucky. Maybe in ten. Yeah. That's, yeah. Just review his pockets carefully. Um, it might be easier to find a mic than a battery. You see what you got. Let me see what I can scavenge out of one of my portabrace kits. Okay. 
Okay. That so far, is our last chance. So far, nothing, but in case he left me something, you know. Do you have anything? Uh, it looks like not. I'll be back in two days. I swiped it from the guy here. That's our, our video work. We, we do college computer textbooks and computer software, so we do shoot videos. So I have a guy who does our videos of taking computers apart and stuff. Cool. Which is why I don't know anything about the camera. Sorry for the delay. I got, <laughs> I got the call at 8.15 that woke me up saying, you gotta be here, you gotta be here. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Hurry up and wait. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's going modestly well so far this morning, I'm afraid. It's, uh, yeah, well. So what does a disaster look like? It's pretty much like this. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think that's what it is. I think that the because I know they did some recording. He used he used the lapel mic last week, which is why I knew it worked last week. And I bet you the the camera the mic got left on. Yeah. And that's what's causing because no work then. Oh, uh, I think you caught it there. Oh, under the chair. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I forgot about his tether here. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and I think they're quite low on equipment because we weren't expecting so many uh, interview slots. Um, getting good response from the veterans for recording. Yeah, I had a, I had a good one yesterday. I really had a fun time. Yeah. Can we get you some coffee or anything? No, thank you. I just had breakfast before I came. I think I'm gonna reload. I'll be right back. I'll let you in the door. You know what? I'm gonna prop it up and do Okay. Stuff. The door. Also, we, the, we keep locking ourselves out. Yes. Um, some days go better than this, actually. Some days have gone better than this. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I, so we brought this camera as a backup in case something happened to one of the others, but then when we needed to extend the room, that's when it got called into service last night. But. This is a very small camera, it seems. Yeah, it was like, because they, they were because they were worried in case something happened to the ones that they had in the upstairs room. So I said, well, this, you know, this is what I can bring with me. It's not great, but it's, it's what I can bring. So I'll bring it in case. Mm -hmm. So I brought it in case, but now we're having, there's so many slots, I'm having trouble getting. I thought I heard something. Yeah, I think there's somebody knocking at this door. No? No? Nobody? Sorry. Yeah, I thought I heard somebody there too, but it, uh, yeah. So now filling all the all the slots, trying to find the volunteers to do the filming and the thing, and the camera in the room. And it, uh, but this is the easiest time to interview you guys, since we have you here in one place. After this weekend, it requires a lot more travel to interview you. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know. From uh, Canton, New York, James Winterbottom. Have you ever run into him at any oh, of the Northeast we meetings? Winterbottom, yes. Um, yes. He used, to, he used to write me letters every now and then. Oh, and illustrates them. Complain well, he was complaining about something. Mm. Uh, and he was writing to me because I was, at the time, uh, I guess I was president of the upstate New York chapter. Okay. Or not president, but, I'm sorry, but uh, we had a little newsletter. Mm -hmm. And I was the editor, that's what it was. Yeah, I haven't seen him. I, I'm not sure he's still living or not. No, he is. I, he is. I get a letter from him almost every week. He, oh, really? he Yeah, I've, I've been working on a book for some years, and he ends up figuring heavily in it. He was my uncle's squad sergeant. My uncle was an F-85, and Yo, James Charlie, Winterbottom up, was the squad sergeant. Was, uh, uh, James Winterbottom was my uncle's squad sergeant. My, my uncle was in F-85, uh -huh. and he was in James Winterbottom's squad. Uh -huh. And so James Winterbottom then had figured fairly heavily in my research. And Dan, if you go ahead and take off that mic. Yes. Okay. We will remove that. Oh, button through here.
to add these, add these work. Well, I'm, I'm talking, there's an area called the mall. But usually her crew does better work. Oh, God. I'm not even usually the crew. That's why this is sad. Test one, two. <laughs> test one, two. Test one, two. Test one, two. So impossible. Test one, two. Test one, two. Test, test, test. I know, it's just like totally cold. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. What do you see down there? See, I'm still not getting it. But I had to do like three converters. This is not that video. Good there. Definitely left it there. Since um, I left the time okay. schedule. Put, put me in. Catch up. Test, test, test. Definitely. Test, test, test. You're on. You're on. Oh, thank God. Can you stand here? I'll make them up. Okay. Oh, this part. This part goes with you. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Apparently, it takes a village. We definitely. <laughs> Guess we should have done that first, huh? Well, now we got to know you better, Horton. We know about your first car, which I believe you said was a Buick, right? Plymouth? Plymouth. Yeah. Pontiac. Pontiac. That's right. I didn't hear what color it was, though. I had a Plymouth, a couple of them. Later. What color? What make? I had two Plymouths. I had Ford ones. Lately. You won't tell your wife on me, will you? Can you tell me about the Plymouth? What make was that? What model? What model was your car? What model was it? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> Do you remember what color it was? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't. Only women would remember what color it was. I know, that's a girl thing, isn't it? The Pontiac, the first car I had was red. I Do remember that. Marks like that. But I've been in correspondence with a, a Durfee who lives in, uh, in Baltimore, and correspondence that I've met him and his wife. Right. He's figured that they were fifth cousins. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we're ready to roll here. Um, we'll just slide everybody down because we started late. Yeah. So he gets his full. Okay. Have you ever done one of these before on the 10th Mountain Division? I'm sorry? Have you ever done one of these? Uh, in interviews? Person? Yeah. Well, yeah, um, though it wasn't filmed. Okay. It was, I think, tape recorded. And this was in, I guess it was also here in Denver. Okay. Um, this is Charlie Sanders. I'm going to be interviewing Horton Durfee, or Defee. Uh, can you spell it? Spell your last name. D-U-R-F-E-E. -E. And uh, Horton was uh, 86L. Today is August 4th. 4th, 2007, and it's 9.30 a.m., and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being patient while we <laughs> worked out the technical <laughs> difficulties. So let's start at the beginning. Um, where, where were you born and brought up? I was born in Geneva, New York, and lived there until I uh, had finished college. I uh, went to college there at, Ho at Hobart in Geneva. And um, after I finished college, I worked for two years in Geneva at the New York State Experiment Station in agricultural research. And then I came, I went to Cornell to get my master's degree. And after that, I taught for a number of years. Taught science in a private secondary school. 
boarding school. Okay. Uh, going back to when you were, were uh, being raised in, in upstate New York, were you a winter sports enthusiast? Well, a mild enthusiast, let's say. I, I did learn to ski uh, in Geneva. Uh, I was never very good at it, uh, but I, I did like it. And when I was in, uh, I, I went to the same boarding school that I taught, later taught at, and graduated in 1943 when I was uh, 17, and I knew I was going to be drafted very soon. Uh, and I heard from my mother that the Army had set up a program uh, where the Army would send you to college, and finally, after you graduate from college, you'd be commissioned. So that sounded pretty good to me, and I got involved in the program and uh, was sent to a branch of Syracuse University in Auburn, New York, and was there for about three months when the, uh, now I had turned 18 by then, so I was then eligible to be drafted, but the program uh, folded for some reason. And I was then sent to Fort Dix, and from Fort Dix, I did my basic training in Texas at Camp Walters. And when I was backing up uh, at Auburn, I, one of my good friends there uh, was a fellow named Chuck Guder. And I later ran into Chuck at basic training at Camp Walters in Texas, uh, quite by accident. He was there as well as I. And quite by accident, we both, uh, independently of each other, uh, wished to, uh, asked to be uh, assigned to the Tenth Mountain Division. I thought that sounded pretty good. Learning how knew how to learn how to ski. I got out to Colorado, and uh, as we got off the train, or as I got off the train there in uh, uh, in uh, Texas, or sorry, in yeah, at Camp Swift by then. Who should get off the train with me but my friend Chuck Goder. Now, you joined the 10th at, four, at Swift. Yeah, well, yes, I did. I never got to Colorado, never got to learn how to ski better. Okay. Now, um, what time of year did you arrive at, uh, at Swift? I'm sorry, what? What time of year? Was it hot? Oh, yeah, indeed it was, yeah, because it was, um, I did both my basic training in, at Camp, Camp Alders in Texas, uh, and then at Swift, and it was probably August, so, and it was hot, yeah. Now, heat exha exhaustion, I think, uh, is talked about by a lot of guys as being a, a real problem. Did you notice that the guys coming down from high altitude had a harder problem acclimating to the desert? than you did, having obviously been doing basic down there? No. No, I can't, I can't recall that that was never the case. You told a great story last night about um, your experience with mules, or lack thereof. C can, you, can you tell that one again, because it was uh, so uh, interesting and, uh, and funny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one morning after breakfast, we were at uh, Camp Swift, um, there was a detail assigned to go and uh, bring back the mules. And I was a member of that detail. So we set off and walked and walked a heck of a long way. We walked out of the camp as nearly as I recall, uh, but eventually came uh, to the mules. And I can't remember how they got there. They were just there. and. No instructions of what to do, except if we're uh, supposed to take one and bring it back to camp. So I went up to my mule. I didn't know much about mules. Never, I had seen one, of course seen pictures of them and heard uh, reputation of their stubbornness and so on. So I went up and <clears throat> introduced myself to the mule and said we're going to go for a little walk. and. Um, uh, enjoyed making his acquaintance and said so let's go and the mule didn't move and 
he had a, a rope or, or a halter, I guess, and I tugged on that and said, "Come on, let's go." And he wouldn't move. And so I gave a harder yank. And at that point, he uh, picked up his right foreleg and planted it firmly on my right foot. And so I got a little mad. And so I said, come on, you son of a bitch, get moving. Nothing, nothing. But in the meantime, I noticed out of the tail of my eye that all the other mules, and I was, mine was the first in the lead, so to speak. All the others behind me were there, guys pulling or walking along or moving up. And uh, I thought, oh dear, I said, this thing is <clears throat> not going to go along. And what am I going to do? I'm going to have to spend the day here anchored to the ground with this <laughs> creature. And my foot was beginning to hurt. And I was getting a little concerned. Other people passed me with their mules, and finally I was the last one left. And as the, uh, as the last one passed by, my mule decided that it was time to go along. So off we went, and without further incident, walked back to camp. And that was the beginning of your, beginning of your lifelong love affair with mules. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did have mules, of course. Uh, they were used primarily, as I recall, for uh, the heavy uh, machine guns, the 50 caliber machine guns, and also for the uh, mortars, which were broken down. And, and I've forgotten how many mules we had in each company. There were at least three, I think, and perhaps more. Now, one of the things that gets talked about is the morale of the division sinking when they came from Colorado to, to Swift. Did you notice um, that there was grumbling in the ranks when you joined, or was that something that you were oblivious to? Well, of course, there's always grumbling, regardless of where you are and the conditions. Um, some of it was justified, I suppose, but uh, most of it is just sort of uh, show. This is, I, I'm assuming, the, the summer of 1944. And D-Day happens. Um, were you eager to get into the war? Were most of the guys eager to get in? Or was there a feeling that maybe you'd get to spend the war stateside? Well, I think a lot of them uh, were, were uh, annoyed that uh, they'd been taken out of Colorado, taken out of Camp Hale and brought down to Texas for flatland training, which is not what they signed up for. They were signed up to be skiers, not uh, uh, flatlanders, so to speak. And though I wasn't necessarily aware of it, I think that the morale was low. The commanding general was uh, the division at that time um, was, was not well. As I understand it, and we saw, seldom saw him, and I think morale was probably pretty low uh, until um, we found out that we were going to go abroad, though we didn't know where. And now, you were a private at this point. Yeah. Now, did you actually see General Hayes when he arrived? Did he address the troops? Did I do what? Did, did, when General Hayes arrived? Yes. Um, do you have any recollections of that? Oh, we were, we, we thought he was terrific, you know, everybody sort of fell in love with him, I think. Uh, he really uh, bolstered our spirits a lot and made a tremendous difference. Um, they put you on a train and took you to Virginia to load, be loaded onto troop ships. Um, had you already been assigned to 86L at that point? Yes. So you were with the folks that you were going to be, you assumed, going into combat with at the time. Mm -hmm. What was the feeling of anxiety or expectation in making that move uh, across the country? Uh, there was mild, I'd say on my part, mild anxiety perhaps, but I suppose everybody felt some because you just didn't know what the future held in store. But I think in a way we were all exhilarated that we were going to be doing something and particularly those that had been in, in Colorado and 
uh, though we didn't, again, didn't know where we were going. We knew at least that we were going to Europe rather than Asia, and that uh, uh, pleased us considerably. Now, uh, were you in contact with your parents? My parents? Yes. Uh, up until the day, just about the day we left, I, uh, I had written, written home. Uh, though they didn't know, this was when we were at Camp Patrick Henry, which was the, uh, the staging area for embarkation, embarkation. Um, my parents didn't know where I was, because that was all supposed to be very hush-hush. Okay. Um, I imagine a great deal of anxiety on their part. Uh, I expect so, yeah. They put you on a ship with bunks stacked up. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can you talk about the passage to, sure. uh, to Gibraltar? Well, when, uh, while we were at Camp Patrick Henry, uh, we were there for several days, almost, well, I guess more than a week. Uh, and one of the things that we were there for was to check our health. And this included dental work. So everybody went to the dentist and had his teeth checked and fixed whatever needed to be done. When it came my turn, I went to the dentist and it turned out I had two uh, cavities and they didn't have time to uh, take care of them at that point. So I made an appointment for the next day. And this is a little story, is that all right? If I, well, I was walking by uh, first of all, I have to say that the first sergeant of our company was a guy I uh, sometimes had a little friction with. His name was Bill Brown. So I was heading off for the dental clinic and walking by the building that housed the company headquarters when this voice roared out through the window, Durfee! And I came to a sudden halt. I said, yes, sergeant? Where do you think you're going? To the dentist, Sergeant. Now I thought, I have two cavities to be filled. Well, all right, but you come straight back here, are you here? Don't you go anywhere, come straight back here. Yes, Sergeant. So I went off to the dentist and had not two, but four cavities filled, all without benefit of Novocaine. So it was a rather rough afternoon. And on the way back, feeling rather sorry for myself, I stopped at the PX, which is on the way to and from, and bought a magazine to read. And as I walked back towards my barracks and passed the company headquarters, a voice roared out the window, Durfee! Yes, Sergeant. Where did you get that magazine? At the PX, Sergeant. I thought I told you to come straight back here. And I knew I was sunk because the PX, while it was on the same street, was set back a little bit, so I had to deviate from the path. So I was put on KP for the next couple of nights. <laughs> well, you can yell at Sarge. I think he's here uh, this week, is it? Pardon? I think Sarge Brown is here this week. Yes. Yeah. Well, I understand he's on the list anyway. I haven't seen him, yeah. but I hope I do because we became pretty good friends after that. <laughs> now, what was it like on the ship? Well, we boarded the ship, and uh, prior to that, uh, I did go to the PX again, uh, this time legally, so to speak, and I bought a box of uh, Hershey bars, 24 Hershey, milk chocolate Hershey bars, and a book to read while we were going. And when we boarded the ship, we were taken down into the hold. And yes, as you said, the bank bunks were stacked, I think, about five high. And I was probably about the fourth bunk up. And it was quite a trick figuring out how to get into them, because there wasn't much space between one bunk and the one above it. But you, with the aid of a little gymnastics, you could manage to pull yourself up and into the bunk, which I did. And I opened the... Uh, well, then I guess I went back up to uh, watch us depart and went back down to my bunk and climbed in, opened my book and opened the box of Hershey bars and ate the bars one after the other until they were all gone. 
<laughs> By that time, the ship was getting out into the ocean and the swells were beginning to increase. And uh, uh, my stomach began to feel a little queasy. So I went back up on deck to get a little fresh air. And I survived uh, that uh, consumption. But I've never much liked ch milk chocolate since then. You fed the fish. <laughs> <laughs> so you arrived in the 86th, um, was assigned to go where? The, uh, the ship landed at Naples. And that was a rather incredible uh, sight as we approached Naples. This was sh shortly before Christmas, a couple of days before Christmas. And we woke up in the morning, the ship had, I guess, come to anchor and went up on deck, looked out, and the harbor was a, a large harbor, but it was full of sunken ships. There was very little room for our ship to maneuver. But of equal uh, interest was the fact that there were a whole swarm of small boats, rowboats, uh, manned by somebody pulling the oars and little kids uh, who would jump into the water to chase anything that the GIs on the ship threw overboard, candy, coins, and so forth, and watch these kids. Uh, they were really expert at it because you'd throw a coin into the water and they would dive down and they would come up with that coin even before it had a chance to hit bottom. I don't know how deep the harbor was, but probably pretty deep. That was... Uh, something I've uh, never forgotten. Was there a lot of devastation that you could see that was apparent? Yes, uh, it was. Um, as I say, beside the ships, a lot of the buildings were pretty badly damaged. And as soon as we got off, uh, I and a group of others were put on a truck which wound its way up the hill for quite a ways away from the harbor and we got off a rather large building, which had a lot of windows in it, but no glass. That had all been blown out. And I don't know what this place was. Somebody said it was a university. Somebody else said it was a hospital. Um, but that's where we stayed. And we just spread our sleeping bags out on the cold stone floor, concrete, whatever. And we're there for a couple of nights until we moved up north to um, closer to uh, the Apennines. Now, there was a tragic uh, minefield incident, I think, very shortly after you arrived? The very first, yeah, well, there were two incidents. The one perhaps you're referring to was that after we left Naples, we went by, by a, a coastal freighter that is my company anyway, and I don't know how many more there were. It was that night that we went north. Not a very comfortable journey. It was, we were again down the hole, of course, and it was smelly and noisy. But we uh, survived and went up north, got off at the city of Leghorn, Livonia, as it's properly called. And then uh, taken by truck a few miles uh, east uh, to Pisa or nearby where we were pitched our tents on a sort of plane. And after that, uh, we left and went back north of Leghorn. And I've forgotten the name of the town. But this is where this incident happened that you mentioned, that uh, there was a railroad track that ran beside where we were. Uh, and it had been, the, the engineers had uh, tape that off, with the, the yellow tape, to indicate that it was uh, dangerous. We're not to cross the tracks, in other words, or walk in them. And further up the line, maybe 50 yards distant, uh, there was a place where they had uh, cleared the mines out of the roadbed, track bed. So <clears throat> you could go across and actually uh, walk up and down. We had uh, somebody doing sentry duty, as I recall, walk up and down there. And then, 
one day, I guess I was, I was sitting uh, writing a letter perhaps. Anyway, this explosion occurred right nearby and quite a lot of shouting after the initial shock and silence subsided. And then right after that, a second explosion. And what had happened apparently was that somebody who was going on guard duty uh, had uh, disregarded the instructions not to cross where the tape was, hadn't bothered to go up the hundred yards or so required to cross the line, and had walked and stepped on a mine. And that uh, happened right next to where the second battalion of the 86, their, the battalion medics were stationed. So several of them uh, ran out to help this poor unfortunate person. Also the, the uh, regimental chaplain went out and they stepped on mines and were also inside. I don't know how many were killed, but, but uh, there were some casualties there certainly. Was that a wake up call? Oh, yeah. It was very sobering and a sort of anticlimactic because it wasn't what you expected. I mean, you expected to go up in the line and, and possibly step on a mine and get killed, but uh, uh, have it before we were in action, so to speak. Not good. Yep. Yeah. Um, again, you're 18 years old. Um, how did you mentally prepare for, you know, going on the line? Well, I don't know if you, if you actually mentally prepare. You just know that you're going to go. You don't know what it's going to be like. Um, it's well, a new adventure in a way. One thing, of course, you feel is in a way that, you've, that, uh, that you're not going to get killed. There's that eternal optimism, I guess, that uh, young people have. Just as an aside, did you know anyone who felt that they were going to get killed? No. 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 So you go up on the line. What happens next? I'm just trying to think. We had been... We, we had been... Um, Well, We've been several places, and one of the places that we've been to, at least we, I say my, my company, uh, was a little village of uh, Querziola, which was not much of a place. Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and after being there for a while, I think we were there twice actually, but after being there, uh, we were sent back uh, uh, to Luca. Uh, which was a rest area, and uh, spent several days there and had an interesting uh, and amusing incident there. Um, and then we went up on the line, and again, it was, yes, uh, uh, in Querziola, and we what were was there. The incident couple, in the rest area? Beg pardon? What was the incident in the rest oh. area? Uh, oh, <laughs> well, um, I was in the headquarters company, and I was the company runner. And my good friend Chuck Guter was the company radio man. And one of the, uh, uh, we were there in uh, Luca for, for several days. It was quite nice. There were two things that happened, actually. First of all, I had just been issued a pair of ski boots. And uh, no skis. So I went to the supply sergeant and said, uh, uh, asked if there were going to be skis, and the sergeant said uh, he didn't think so. And I said, well, can I turn these boots in? And the sergeant said, no, they've been issued to you and they're yours. Now these ski boots, even like the ski boots today, were pretty clumsy, and they had very smooth soles. They were also heavy. But I thought, well, okay, uh, uh, I can wear them. But I, I was worried about the smoothness of the soles. So I took the boots and went to a, a cobbler in the little village there 
and uh, showed them the smooth soles. And I also spied what I had hoped I'd see, uh, hobnails in the display case. So I pointed to the hobnails and said, there. And uh, the cobbler nodded. <coughs> and I said, uh, domani, meaning tomorrow. And he said, si. And so the next afternoon, I went back and uh, got the boots and held out some money. And he took what, uh, what was due him. So I had my ski boots and the hobnails worked pretty well. But I never did like the boots because they were so heavy and they were clumsy. So there was that incident. But the, just about the last day we were there, Kurt Kreiser, who was our platoon sergeant, sent uh, Chuck Gooder and me uh, outdoors to uh, practice our protocol. That is how you use the, uh, the radios and so forth. So we went out. Uh, out of, this was a, we were encamped in a, in a villa. And actually, I don't think we were in the main building itself, but outside. But anyway, uh, out and back was an olive orchard. And Chuck and I went out to the olive orchard and picked out a tree. Uh, you could sit down nicely and lean your back against. And about 10 yards away, I sat down under a similar tree back and had my, uh, what they call a handy talkie, which is a uh, radio about so big on just one frequency and carried on this conversation. Now, uh, the protocol involved identifying yourself as well as uh, identifying the person by uh, their location. And so you start with the regiment, which was called Remount, that is the 86th Infantry Remount. Then uh, to the battalion, and they were red, white, and blue. And since we were in the third battalion, we were remount blue. Then, uh, and the uh, company in the battalion, it was uh, the phonetic alphabet A, B, C, or D. And since we were the third one, we were C or Charlie. So it was remount blue, Charlie. And then finally, uh, in the company, uh, the platoons, uh, first platoon was one, second platoon was two, third platoon uh, was uh, three, uh, then the fourth platoon was four, and the uh, executive officer was five, and that was the guy I was assigned to, and finally six for the company command. So it was Remount Blue Charlie five or six or whatever. So so anyway, okay, we were out there, and I started off by saying, uh, "Hello, Remount Blue Charlie." No answer from Gooder. So I tried again. Hello, Remount Blue Charlie. No answer. Hello, Remount Blue, Charlie. Gooder, you forgot to say over. Oh, okay. Hello, Remount Blue, Charlie, over. No answer. Well, asshole, what's the matter? Gooder, you forgot to say who you are. Oh. Hello, Remount Blue Charlie. This is Charlie Six. Gooder, I'm Charlie Six. You're Charlie Five. Now, for Christ's sake, will you get this straight and do it right? Well, it went on in this vein for a while, but we finally got it squared away and um, uh, tried to dream up situations where we needed to communicate with each other. 
But soon <laughs> we got tired of this and uh, dozed off to sleep. So what happened on the night before Belvedere and, uh, and Gorgolowska? Well, for several nights we'd been in a little uh, a farmhouse and uh, there was no action to, during the day, of course, because uh, Quetzalcoatl was partway up the flank of Belvedere and the Germans up above could, could look down on us. So all of our activities were at night. And even at night, though, I guess they set out patrols, but finally when it was time to go, it was probably uh, around four in the morning. Don't know, really. And it set out, um, and at first the, the, uh, uh, the going was pretty easy, but then it got steeper and steeper, the climb, and people up ahead of me, because it was quite dark then, still being, the people up ahead of me uh, occasionally would loosen rocks which would come tumbling down and this scared the devil out of me because I was sure I was going to be hit with one of these things and break a leg or something like that and I was really scared I was more scared of that than I was of any possible contact with with the Germans but anyway we finally um, uh, got to the top of where we were going whether it was the top of Belvedere. Actually, it was, we were apparently not on Belvedere, but on uh, uh, Gorgoleso, I guess it was, the next mountain up the chain. And the dawn, uh, as the dawn lightened, we began to see, see where we were. And we, as I recall, we came out um, in a wooded area slightly wooded and I was lost I didn't know where my company commander Captain Bailey was uh, or any anybody else except there was one fellow named well, I can't remember his name um, that I ran into and he was sort of lost too and we were wondering what to do where to go which direction to go actually uh, when all of a sudden uh, a shot rang out and uh, this guy uh, keeled over and he'd been shot right through the heart. And I yelled for a medic uh, and uh, tried to get at his first aid kit, which was underneath him. And he fell on his, uh, right back on his back. And he died instantly, I could tell just by looking at his eyes and that I couldn't get at his first aid kit, uh, which wouldn't have done any good anyway, but I felt I ought to do something. So I took my own first aid kit, which was, you were not supposed to do, and tried to bandage him, but he was too, too big and heavy to, you know, wrap, get the claws wrapped around underneath him. So I did the time-honored thing, got his bayonet, put it on, stuck the rifle in, put his helmet on, went on my way. That's, that's one of the, uh, I eventually I must have caught up with the rest of the company somewhere because the next thing I remember was we were going across a field um, and the engineers had gone ahead of us and cleared a path for us and we were spaced out um, you're supposed to keep a certain distance apart, so if you step on a mine, you don't get the body too. And just as we were we were going through, and I was near the end of the line, and, and the line must have been maybe 100, 150 yards at this guy's single file, one after another. Uh, and an airplane came overhead, and I was rather surprised because the uh, uh, we hadn't heard anything about it. Our activity didn't know whether this was a German plane or what it was. Well, it turned out to be one of ours. And it was a little spotter plane. I think it was probably uh, from the artillery. Uh, they used planes for uh, spotting purposes. But in any case, right at the head of the line, uh, I was looking up at this plane and all of a sudden 
a bomb came out of it and spiraled down and landed uh, right at the head of our column exploded and uh, as we finally caught up to that spot uh, there was a crater hole and the, the lead person there had been killed that was the first injury that I'd seen casualty I'd seen Were those friend was the first one a friendly fire incident as well I'm sorry was the first uh, KIA a friendly fire I think maybe it, it had been uh, though this didn't occur to me till some time later but because uh, it, the shot came from behind us so to speak I think it may have been friendly fire and God knows why I wasn't also picked off because I was right closest to this fellow as I am to you. Were you consciously fearful of friendly fire as much as enemy fire? That was the only instance that I know of specifically that my own wound came from friendly fire and from our own artillery. And when was that? Well, that was about, um, see, the the initial launch was February 19th and it was March 3rd that I was wounded so I was there only about two weeks in, in, in action. Well, before we get to that, once you got up on Gorgolesco, could you see Della Taraccia from there? Well, I don't recall. Um, there was always something Ahead, uh, but I didn't know the names at the time, except Belvedere. If I had heard of them, it wouldn't have meant anything. But um, for the next several days, there was heavy, heavy fighting in that area. Was your company involved in that? Yeah, it, it was, I personally was not. I think quite often uh, we were in reserve. Uh, what bothered me the most was uh, nighttime when uh, the Germans would shell us and the very f uh, either the first or the second night I think it was probably the first night Captain Bailey uh, had been injured in this unexpected bomb from our our plane um, when the crater the bomb landed and exploded a lot of there's a lot of debris of course earth and rocks and so forth and a rock had come down and and uh, hurt captain bailey's elbow and since i was uh, also his uh, his aide you might say as company runner uh, i took often took care of he preparing his meals such as they were sea rations and so on uh, and um, digging his foxhole if he wasn't able to and he clearly wasn't able to under the circumstance cause. so I dug the foxhole for him and another, another fellow uh, Phil Burns who was assistant radio operator uh, the three of us huddled in this foxhole at night and I can remember the Germans shelled us with, uh, with the phosphorus shells and this terrified me because I knew that uh, phosphorus could land and burn, it keep on burning and it landed on uh, clothing or even flesh, though it never uh, were trouble that way. I, I was convinced. And this went on for several nights. So the night times were, were, were awful. Um, did you ever see anybody hit with a phosphorus shot? No, no, never did. Um, things quieted down after a while and everything leading up to the next stage which was March 3rd um, can you talk a little bit about you, you had been in your first combat experience was there a period of adjustment while you waited to go back in well uh, we would move forward uh, day by day but you want me to talk about March 3rd sure yeah yeah, that was uh, a fairly easy morning. It, one of the things that, uh, in, in spite of the fact that there was quite a lot of snow around, was the days were getting warm. Nights were always cold. That was part of the problem 
living through a night because we never had enough warmth. We didn't have sleeping bags. We didn't have, I think we had one blanket among the, for the three of us. But uh, the days were getting warm. And on that particular day, uh, we were moving through a lightly forested area. Uh, and it was, came time uh, for lunch. And we stopped. And I took out my shovel to dig a foxhole. That's one thing you're always supposed to do. Every time you stop, you dig a foxhole. And I dug mine down uh, to about uh, uh, the depth of four inches, perhaps. Uh, the soil was sandy. It was fairly digging, easy digging. But there were a lot of tree roots that uh, I was having difficulty with. So I got tired of, of digging. And I took off my mountain jacket that I was wearing and my sweater. I had a sleeveless sweater that, uh, through the courtesy of the Red Cross, I guess. And decided that I would uh, have my lunch instead. I had a can of sea rations. Uh, Captain Bailey was nowhere in sight. I don't know where he was. But I opened up my sea rations can and decided that against, uh, uh, I was going to set up my little stove and warm it, but I decided against doing that. And I had just finished uh, eating my spaghetti and meatballs when uh, this bombardment began and the shells came in in an area that seemed to me not much bigger than this, certainly this suite here, uh, and perhaps less so. And all I had was a four-inch deep foxhole, so I probably should have uh, waited to have lunch a little later and concentrated on digging. But in any case, uh, one shell landed apparently right next to my foxhole and exploded, and uh, I got shell fragments, one in my back, uh, my right leg pretty badly, uh, my left leg. And the uh. Were you able to call for a medic? Uh, I didn't. Um, when it was all over, I, um, and I don't know how long it went on, not too long. What had happened was that uh, this was our own artillery. And they had instructions uh, to fire on this particular spot because the Germans had been there. But uh, we, the Germans had been moved out. So we were there at the same time, and uh, there wasn't time to get word back to the artillery to uh, what had happened. Uh, and ca I, under I understand that Captain Bailey uh, did uh, get to a field phone or whatever, and uh, the bombardment stopped. But not before, I don't know how many shells there were, per six, eight, perhaps. Was uh, killed? And when it was all over, um, I thought, well, gee, maybe somebody else is hurt worse than I am. So I didn't call for a medic. But I was groaning. And Harrison Suedos, who was our chief medic, and also a good friend of mine, uh, came over and uh, patched me up, got me on a litter, and off I went to aid station. Were you able to walk? No. So you were carried it uh, on a litter. Yeah. Um, do you, did they give you morphine? Pardon? Were you given a shot of morphine? No. Uh, when I got back to an aid station, um, I asked the uh, the doctor there to, if I could have morphine, and he said no. And it, I always wondered why. And I asked. I happened to, to meet him uh, many years later. Uh, one of our Italian trips, and uh, he said something to the effect that morphine would have killed me. Okay. A respiration issue, or uh, so. Tell me about the period of recuperation. Did, were you operated on? Yes, I went back to a field hospital then, uh, and it took quite a while to get there, and. <clears throat> 
what happened was after our, uh, Harris and Suedos, uh, and after uh, the aid station there with uh, uh, Dr. Meinke, uh, I was, I got, they, oh, there was a cheap, let's see, what was the sequence? I guess what they did then at the, uh, at the aid station was put me in an ambulance, which eventually wound up at a, a hospital. And the, the ride in the ambulance back up a little bit here. Um, I guess after the A station I was put on a, a passing jeep that came by. The, this jeep apparently had been outfitted uh, to hold litters. And I rode on that and I remember uh, my hands getting very cold and there was a guy in the front seat of the jeep who lent me his gloves uh, for which I was very grateful. And then uh, uh, he, the, the jeep stopped and this, the owner of the gloves had to get off and had to take back his gloves, which I didn't, uh, was not too happy about. But, uh, the, <clears throat> the jeep came to a, yet another uh, transfer point, I guess, and there I was put in an, uh, uh, in an ambulance along with a couple of other people and be the ambulance then drove to a field hospital and while I was in the ambulance, I managed to turn on my side. I'd been lying on my stomach in, in considerable pain.